Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is our father, Emmanuel Katongole. I'm a priest of Kampala Archdiocese in Uganda. I currently serve as professor of theology and international peace studies at the University of Notre Dame in South Bend, Indiana, USA. I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers of this retreat for bringing us together from around the world to reflect on this uh, very, very crucial topic of nonviolence which is a spirituality, a way of life, and a strategy for social transformation. I would like to focus my reflections around the spirituality part, nonviolence as a spirituality. To say that nonviolence is a spirituality is to say and affirm that it is grounded in the journey with God, and that this journey with God leads into the heart of God, into the way of God. That is why from a Christian point of view, we are excited and committed to nonviolence, not simply because it works, not simply because it is an effective strategy for social transformation. It may be all that. Our primary commitment to nonviolence is because it is the way of God that it is connected to the way that God creates, rules, and redeems the world. God is love, and we are created in God's image, which means created in love, with love, and for love. Love is our true identity and our true calling. And that's what we come to see clearly in the person of Jesus Christ in his ministry, in his life, in his preaching, his death and resurrection. For as the apostle Paul says, in him, the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. In him, we see clearly the fullness of God's self-sacrificing love. And in that self-sacrificing love, he is inviting us into that revolution a revolution of love, a revolution of tenderness. So nonviolence is just the external boundary, if you like, where we have to affirm that we have to say no to violence if we are to belong into this revolution of love. So what I would like to do um, in the brief time that I have is to share briefly three stories and reflect briefly on those stories with view of highlighting some key convictions that sustain the spirituality of nonviolence. First of all, my own story. Growing up, I was a bitter and angry young man. My dad died when I was 12 years. I lived and grew up under the brutal dictatorship of Idi Amin, lots of suffering, Lots of people, including neighbors, killed, and many people disappeared. Economic uh, embargoes and very, very stringent economic conditions. Experiences that all contributed to shape me into a very angry and bitter young man. When I finished high school, I decided to join the Liberation Forces, the forces that were fighting to oust Idi Amin. It was only by the grace of God that I was actually saved from that lie that we can create peace through violence. And for me, the grace came through sickness. I became greatly sick, was admitted in the hospital where I stayed for over a month. And during my stay in the hospital, sick, very sick, weak, I discovered a gift. It was the gift of love the love from the medical mission sisters who run the hospital, from my doctors, my nurses, my classmates and my teachers who would come and sit in my room and would talk away in the evening. I discovered through that experience of being loved that there was something precious about my life. And I discovered it in a way that I had never felt it before. It was then that I began to think that perhaps God might have a purpose for my life. 
it was actually there that I discerned and discovered the vocation to the priesthood. So in that love that I experienced in the context of my being sick, I was returned, if you like, to myself. I say this because my life as a priest, what I do, my ongoing appreciation of the court nonviolence is all connected to that experience of suffering and yet of discovering love. That is the experience, if you like, that inducted me, recruited me, if you like, drafted me into the revolution of God's tenderness and love. How about you? How and when were you drafted into the revolution of love? This is important because nonviolence is not just an abstract strategy. It's not just an abstract principle or a strategy for the transformation of the world. Of course it is, but it is grounded in a personal journey. It is grounded in a discovery of one who's true identity as God's child and as beloved. And in that discovery, it's also a discovery of how precious one whose life is and the life of everyone else. In fact, it is through that discovery that one begins to shape what Archbishop Desmond Tutu calls disciplines of goodness. Everyday practices of humility, hospitality, gratitude, forgiveness, reconciliation. It is through these everyday practices that a revolution of God's love is shaped. These are what constitute that revolution of tenderness. The second story I want to share is the story of Mama Angelina, a woman in Northern Uganda, a midwife whose daughter was abducted together with 138 other girls by the Lord's Resistance Army fighting against the Ugandan forces in Northern Uganda. Every weekend, the parents of the abducted girls would come together to pray together, to advocate for the release of their children. And as they concluded their meeting, they would pray and attempt to pray the Our Father. But they could not get over the words, forgive us our sins as we forgive. It was too much for them. They were filled with bitterness, with anger for those who had abducted their children. And this went on for a while. After some time, as Mama Angelina tells the story, they felt they had received a gift of forgiveness and they were able to say the Our Father and finish the Our Father. A gift of forgiveness, she said, had come upon them and they felt they had been released, but also they felt the need to go and share that gift of forgiveness with others in the community. She even went and met with the mother of the rebel who was holding her daughter in captivity. They also felt that this gift of forgiveness had deepened their advocacy. And so they went into the community calling for the release of their daughters, but also for an end to war. War cannot be a path to peace, they said. They advocated locally, nationally, internationally, on the radio. In fact, it was on one of those radio advocacy meetings that the rebels called in to Angelina as she was speaking on the radio. And they wanted to give her a deal. They would release her daughter if she stopped the publicity campaign because that was drawing a lot of negative publicity against them, her advocacy. They would release her daughter. And she said, what about the other girls? 
I will stop my advocacy if you release all the other girls. The rebels refused. And she went back home without her daughter because she said, every child is my child. Fortunately, after seven years in captivity, her daughter escaped and returned home. Now, this story of Mama Angelina is important for at least three reasons that help to capture the spirituality of nonviolence. One, it shows how nonviolence, like the gift of forgiveness that Angelina and her fellow parents received, is a gift. They received this gift in the context of praying the Our Father. An unexpected gift, but also a strange gift. So strange that one time Angelina is speaking to the community about the gift of forgiveness, and one elderly woman whose grandchild was abducted is looking at her in disbelief. And she tells Angelina, with all the atrocities that the rebels have committed, how can you even talk about forgiveness? Angelina, are you from another planet? Are you from another planet? You see, even as we affirm nonviolence as a universal ethic, we must remember that in a world that is so used to violence, a call to nonviolence cannot but sound odd, strange. Indeed, something from another planet. It is from another planet because it reflects another logic. It reflects another way, God's way of redeeming the world, of responding to evil, the excess of evil and hatred and violence through an excess of love. Another dimension that is connected to the story of Angelina is that helps to show that nonviolence is not passive. It is a practical form of social engagement, a form of compassion, compassionate advocacy, advocacy with and on behalf, especially of the poor, the weak, the, vo the voiceless. And it is in this compassionate advocacy that nonviolence seeks to interrupt the shells of violence interrupt the shells and the structures of violence through the tenderness of God's love. A third aspect that is connected to Angelina's story is the realization that nonviolence is a journey, a long and painful journey. There is nothing romantic about nonviolence. In the end, for Angelina, she had to sacrifice her daughter. And when she sums up the journey, she describes it as a journey that is painfully sweet. Painfully sweet. The journey involving pain and suffering. That is the case with nonviolence. It involves sacrifice and suffering because it is a participation in God's own journey, in the journey of God's own self-sacrificing love, of God's wounded love. The third story I would like to tell is a story of an archbishop, Archbishop Christopher Monzehirwa of Bokavo, in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Now the Congo as a country has tremendously suffered over 27 years of war 
a war that has claimed over 5.4 million people, displaced millions of people. Archbishop Mozhiwa is appointed Archbishop of Bukavu towards the end of the genocide. And so there are a lot of refugees coming in from Rwanda into his town of Bukavu. And every morning he would go to the bridge that separates the two countries and receive the refugees. In 1996, he issued an Advent pastoral letter and addressed the refugees as follows. And I quote, in entering the way of Christ, we will be able to wish each other a Merry Christmas, the joy of the Son of God who was born in the gush of human history and who knows he will die on the cross to save the world. End of quote. In entering the way of Christ, Muzhirwa used this expression, the way of Christ, frequently and very, very intentionally. What he meant by the way of Christ is Jesus' willingness to accept violence rendered to him rather than for him to use violence to establish the kingdom of God. But for Munzhirwa, the way of Christ was also a social vision, a vision of society founded not on violence, but on non-violent love. War cannot be the foundation of peace, he said. And he reminded the Christians that we must remember, I quote, that war is always something despicable. Those who love peace work to build structures of love, of forgiveness, and justice, end of quote. To build structures of love, of forgiveness, and justice. What Mons Hura meant with these structures of justice, love, and forgiveness are actually everyday practices, practices of love, of gentleness, of forgiveness. That's why when the forces were all gathered around Bukavu, he reminded the Christians to go about their daily business, to plant the fields, to open their shops, to replant the trees, to take care of the nature and the environment and welcome refugees, reminding them that the greatest weapon in the struggle for peace and resistance of violence is solidarity and charity towards everyone. Finally, Muzhiwa, using the expression entering the way of Christ, also meant embracing Christ's cross and the vocation that can lead even to death. This is what Muzhiwa himself did and discovered as he did so that it released him from fear and therefore offered him a new sense of freedom with which he ministered, the courage, but also the everyday forms of simplicity in his own life, and a constant saying no to war and no to violence, which eventually cost him his life. But this is about entering the way of Christ that is about embracing Christ's cross and a vocation that can lead even to violence. So let me briefly conclude by highlighting five key convictions from the stories that I've shared. One, that nonviolence is a personal journey, a personal journey of conversion and an invitation into God's revolution of love. Two, that it is a gift, a gift that is offered to everyone at the same time, an invitation, a call, a vocation for every Christian to enter the way of God, the way that God responds to evil through the excess of love. Three, that is not passive, is a very active engagement, an engagement that takes place through the disciplines of goodness, of everyday practices, of hospitality, of forgiveness, of gentleness, of, of dialogue, of humility. 
these are the disciplines through which that revolution of tenderness is shaped. Four, that it is a long and painful journey, as Angelina says, which involves suffering and sacrifice. This, I think, is what St. Archbishop Oscar Romero was pointing to when he referred to the violence of love. I quote, we have never preached violence except the violence of love, which left Christ nailed on the cross. The violence we preach is not the violence of the sword, the violence of hatred. It is the violence of love, of brotherhood, the violence that wills to beat the weapons into sickles for work." End of quote. And finally, that nonviolence is a beautiful and joyful journey, for it reflects our true identity and our true vocation. And as the letter to the Hebrews encourages us, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross disregarding its shame. For the joy that was set before him. And so, for the joy that is set before us, we too journey on with hope and in confidence, inspired by the words of Archbishop Mons Hirwa in his Advent message. I quote, by entering the way of Christ, in a few days, we'll be able to wish each other Merry Christmas. The joy of the Son of God, who is born in the gush of human history, and who knows that he will die on the cross to save the world. It is this profound joy, our true home, that I already wish for you, and that in solidarity we will construct together. End of quote. Thank you very much, and I wish you all a happy Advent.